that's such a big audience here. So, good morning, everyone. Um, just before we get started, I would like to know a little bit more about you, who is here today. Um, can I ask uh, designers and UX people to raise their hands? Wow, amazing. Okay, product people, product managers, product owners, much less, okay. And developers, even fewer. Okay, and there's like 10% who didn't raise their hands. I wonder who are you guys? Yeah, you can scream. <laughs> Don't be shy. So, uh, my name is Anna, and before we get started, uh, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit more about myself. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about prioritization in product development. And as I promised, uh, a little bit about myself. So when I was just six years old, I was really dreaming about a piano. But my parents were not able to afford one. So I decided to start my very first business. And I convinced my grandfather to team up with me, and we started our potato delivery and selling business over summer. And this is something that helped me to understand the value of right prioritization quite early. Because instead of playing like all other kids, I was playing at the local farmer's market, which looked similar to this. Uh, most of my life I spent in the world of entrepreneurship, and I have a huge graveyard of dead startups which I co-founded. So, yes, I know how to fail, I know how to fail fast, and um, I prioritized wrong things over and over again, so that's why maybe my experience might be relevant for you today. And for the last two and a half years, I have been leading one of the biggest product teams in iZettle. Shortly about Izettle. Izettle is a Swedish fintech company which started in 2010 by providing mobile payment solution for small businesses in Sweden. Today we are in 12 different markets helping uh, merchants all over the world uh, to, uh, to uh, take quick payments and get everything they need to grow their business. Uh, just recently we got uh, acquired by PayPal, we joined the PayPal family, and we are super excited about this acquisition, especially uh, what does it bring to our end users. Uh, the opportunities are really amazing. Ten weeks ago, uh, I got a very powerful stakeholder, and currently I am focusing my full attention on this very loud individual, and we're trying to figure out our way of working with her. By the way, she is somewhere here today, and uh, right now, we work with you in very short sprints, uh, from one to three hours, uh, with very short feedback loops. So if I start sleeping on the stage, please wake me up, because I am on the second sprint today already. Uh, if we do a mistake in prioritization, we have a very short window to correct, um, until she's satisfied, because if she's not, like the entire development team will be affected quite significantly. So, and if we keep prioritizing over and over again something wrongly, yeah, like you don't want to do it. You need to fail fast and correct the situation as soon as possible. And of course, this requires a lot of teamwork. Uh, I ask myself, does my work with Lisa sound similar to product development? Well. I guess so, because the cost of being wrong and wasting resources on something that doesn't bring return on investment might significantly affect your business. Uh, that is why improving your prioritization together with your development team should be your absolute priority. Uh, for me, prioritization, boring stuff now, uh, is a process of deciding on what to do next in order to achieve our goals. And to be honest, there are plenty of prioritization frameworks online, and if your business is growing, uh, your customers love your product, and your stakeholders are satisfied, maybe you don't need any frameworks. Maybe the intuition of your team leader is the best recipe of success. Um, let me invite you to the world of my team. Well, we call it user journey, and we are maybe one of the biggest 
product teams in iZettle, but definitely the most international one. Our team includes mobile and web developers. We are quite back-end heavy. We have UX and visual designers, an analyst, an agile coach, a product manager, and we are purely cross-functional and quite autonomous. So as a growth team, we don't really own any specific product, but rather own a specific part of a customer journey from registration to activation and all systems and platforms behind it. Um, that is why we usually focus on improvements rather than on building new products. And since we work with registration and onboarding experience, and as you already know, iZettle is a fintech company, we have compliance, security, all of those guys, risks, uh, risk, they all on our assets constantly. And um, we have to prioritize really wisely between providing the best possible user experience while not sending our founders to a jail. Um, I would like you to think about your biggest fear in product development. What is that? My biggest fear in product development to build something that customers don't need. But how do we as a team know what to build next? So we tried different frameworks, and we ended up with this one. We call it a cooking process. Um, and almost everything that comes to the sprint backlog goes through this process first. So is, you might see it's all starting from a problems hunting stage. To be honest, we don't really hunt anything because usually problems hunt us. Uh, but ideas, technical improvements, customer pains, jobs to be done, different requests, learning points, market trends, results of research, it all comes from all uh, possible channels. And we don't really have an issue with incoming flow of ideas. We rather have an issue with focusing on what to build next. So let's have a closer look into the first part of this process. Um, as a result of the problem hunting stage, uh, we end up with something what we call, call pool of options. It's basically during this process we filter out absolute no-go and uh, yeah, put everything in one list. And I really like word options because on that moment, team is not committed yet to take it further. And the, the, the word options is actually highlighting it to everyone. Uh, then, during the, then we move on to the problem validation stage, and uh, that's where we filter quite a lot. So maybe from 100% of things which comes into this process, only 20% actually continues and ending up in prioritized list of problems. And that's where most of the drama and action happening, because we need to filter, we have to say no to many things. Um, in order to solve this drama, we came up with three principles. This is something what helped us uh, to prioritize. And let's go through them one by one. So the first one is the art of collaboration. Since our ownership domain, my, my team ownership domain, is very customer facing, uh, we pay a lot of attention to uh, signals from end users by checking reviews, doing surveys, uh, monitoring conversions, and organizing user interviews. Uh, but the most vocal requests actually comes from our internal stakeholders. Um, like marketing, sales, risk, support, legal, logistics. And sometimes ignoring those requests is almost impossible. So that's where the art of collaboration might help. Um, when I started in iZettle two and a half years ago, my team was just four engineers and myself. And uh, very quickly, I realized that the team is constantly interrupted. So uh, people from other teams were coming to us, asking small questions, sending Slack messages. So the team actually was working as an information hub. And I invited all of stakeholders to have their talk in one room for the first time. 20 people came. And stepping into this room wasn't so great. It actually felt like stepping into a lion's den. So it turns to be that most of our stakeholders had no idea about the existence of each other, even if they were representing the same teams. And they had very different opinions on what teams should and shouldn't do. Um, so how did we solve it? We picked uh, one champion per one department, and we started to work with them in very close collaboration, invested in their understanding of agile principles, the way of, we, of, the way of working. Uh, we walked them through our ongoing research and like 
projects. I think the previous presenter was telling about it, uh, like you should invest and explain your stakeholders and explain how you work. Uh, so we did similar thing. And um, as a result, we have got highly engaged individuals who are experts in their domains. And uh, they don't miss any demo. Um, they contribute into our development processes. And uh, they sometimes even sit with us. So because of this extra effort into our collaboration, uh, stakeholders from requesters became contributors. And that allow, allow us to be uh, very fast, not just on day-to-day -day basis, but in critical situations as well. So let me walk you through such a situation. Um, in order to become iZettle customer or iZettle user, uh, every merchant needs to complete specific steps of onboarding. And on that slide, uh, you can see conversion from registration to activation on one of our markets. And as you see, it was growing quite significantly. In, in fact, it actually was doubling, which is super exciting for me. Uh, and here are the proxy metrics which contributes to these final conversions. So each proxy metric represents specific step which customer need to complete before they reach the activation point. Uh, by the way, this is a screenshot of a real dashboard. This is how my team con uh, monitors conversions on everyday basis. Uh, so last September, we were, what, what happened there is that last September we were testing a new concept of onboarding for Android users on eight different markets. And um, it was an experiment meant to be for 10%. We launched it with A-B test. And on seven markets, everything went as expected with conversions. But uh, on one market, we very quickly uh, detected a drop. So we started to analyze what, what's going on wrong, wrong, and we figured out that we're missing a very important uh, market difference. And uh, we had no idea about this market difference before the launch, and in situations like this, you usually have two choices, um, either to roll back uh, or to fix it and start iterating it very quickly. So after calculating the risks, uh, the team decided to iterate, which is really scary, and thanks to our stakeholders because they immediately jumped on board and started to build and validate hypothesis together with us. So um, we all were very transparent about how many users we're going to lose if we're not fixing the problem, um, and that was the best motivation. Uh, in the morning, we were building a hypothesis. Uh, by the evening, we actually were releasing an experiment. And when we were leaving the office, the local market was waking up and uh, starting to collect uh, feedback from end users for us. So the next time, when, the next day when we were coming to the office, we had new information coming in order to move on to the next hypothesis. Uh, while doing those extremely fast cycles, um, we figured out several improvements for the entire market, for the entire 100% of incoming users. And we fixed it very quickly because adrenaline was, you know, keep rolling us. And this ended up in uh, doubling the conversion uh, for the entire market, not just for this 10% on which we were initially experimenting on. And because of our great collaboration with stakeholders who were willing to take risk and jumped on board immediately. So invest in your relationship with stakeholders and involve them into your processes. Of course, it is very time-consuming and relationship-based, but it is definitely going to pay back. Moving on to the next principle, the art of saying no. Uh, do you remember this framework from before? Um, there is one very important difference. Uh, it is the no bucket. So, as you already know, we don't really have a problem of incoming ideas and requests. We rather have a problem of filtering out what not to build. And at any stage of this process, anything can actually end up in the no bucket. Even if it's already like in the Jira and ready to go to the sprint, we still can send it there. We still can kill it. So, but we cannot send something to the no bucket to kill it if we don't understand the request or problem deep enough. And that is where the importance of why plays its role. So I really assume that in this audience, everyone knows about the importance of why. But the question is, do you really use it on an everyday basis? 
So there is an example. Um, our support is reaching out to us and asking to have one more payment option in the checkout of our web shop today, like by the end of the day. And we, of course, asking why. And the answer is because uh, users are calling and they're pissed off and they would like to pay with invoice. And we're asking, well, but why didn't they pay with what is there? Like, why? Why do they want to pay like this? And the answer is um, users tried, but they failed. And this is where the aha moment happening. So, aha, we actually need to fix what is there. We need to fix the credit card uh, payment rate before we actually introduce any new payment options. And that is how you arrive from the solution-based request, like add more payments options as soon as possible by the end of the day, uh, to a problem state. Uh, some of our users can't pay for hardware. And my team might solve the this problem differently, which could be uh, cheaper for us or better for our customers. So in this example, we only ask why twice, but sometimes you really need to ask 100 times and keep asking why, 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 uh, before you get to the problem or hypothesis state. Um, it's very challenging, but it is definitely going to pay back. So why it is important to prioritize problems instead of solutions on that stage? Because your teams are the experts in the domain, and they will find the best possible solution for the situation. Uh, however, if after asking why even 100 times, you end up with answers such as, well, we should do it because it is an industry trend, or because high-level executive came up with this idea in the shower, uh, or because everyone agrees that it is a good idea. So all of this considered by my team as a weak signals, and we try to ignore them, even if it's challenging, especially with the high-level executives' ideas. And we try to send them to the no bucket right away. Uh, that is why one of my team values is question everything. Uh, what else end up in no bucket? Um, for me, there is, in fact, three different no buckets. Uh, not us bucket, not at all bucket, and not now bucket. So on that slide, you can see uh, questions which we're usually asking from requesters or stakeholders in order to filter out some of the requests. So a request that doesn't uh, make sense from the company vision and mission perspective usually end up in not at all bucket. Uh, requests that doesn't contribute to my team goal end up in not us bucket. Requests that are not related to uh, our team domain also end up there. And the last bucket is not now. Usually ideas which are worth trying or problems worth solving, uh, they end up there and uh, we keep them for later. Why? Because uh, sometimes uh, conditions are not ready, such as resources or maybe market is not ready for uh, this product or this idea. So, uh, of course, saying no is very difficult, and um, that's where your leadership skills come in. And if you don't know how to say no, or if you're not saying no to things, then your team will suffer. So, as my team says, there's three types of leaders uh, based on how they affect or pollute the backlog, especially when the shit hits the fan. Uh, it is a shit funnel, it is a shit fan, <laughs> and it is a shit umbrella. So, I really think that as a product manager or a team leader, it is your job not just to pick up the most valuable problems to be solved, but actually also to protect your team and uh, to help them focus and to help them focus to ship and build what was planned. So if you don't know how to say no and start playing a fan or a funnel, then your team will suffer for sure. Uh, by focusing on the art of saying no, we ended up with a, a more clear and transparent way of filtering requests. And we also increased quality of solutions because it helped team to focus, to focus on important things. Uh, the last one is the art of keeping focus. So, we all aim uh, for measurable things, right? We like measure things. If it's not measurable, it's something not for us, right? And for me, focus equals time. So in order to optimize my team time, 
Um, we actually limited the time for decision-making process. And uh, to do that, we ended up with two principles. Uh, one is consent, not consensus. So as you know, my team is very diverse, and we all come from different backgrounds, and uh, sometimes for us, agree on something is super hard. So instead of reaching 100% agreement, uh, we're following this principle, and uh, democratization of decision-making process didn't work well for us, not at all. Um, plus, all decisions in product development, at least for us, are temporary. So instead of aiming for absolute agreement, we rather follow consent principle and don't waste time in um, endless discussions. Another principle, this one, and I think it's very well-known principle. Many companies uh, already use it. But in order to suit, uh, to suit my team uh, better, we actually changed it to this one. So whenever we face the wall and scheduled and limited time for decision-making has passed, we quickly jump into experimenting. Uh, we formulate a hypothesis and validate it as quick as possible. So even if hypothesis was wrong from the very beginning, um, we definitely going to collect valuable insights and data, which will help us uh, to end up with a better decision in the next iteration. So that could be your way out uh, from endless discussions. And whenever data comes, uh, it will be clear what to do next. So by following those principles, we managed to limit time uh, for decision making, and that helped uh, our team to focus more and uh, to ship better solutions to our customers. Um, I walked you through small improvements that helped my team to prioritize better. Um, remember the story about potato business over summer? Yeah, which I was doing. So by the end of the summer, I actually got the money. But in fact, prioritization is a very dynamic process, and my goals changed. So instead of piano, I got a bike. Uh, thank you so much for listening and even laughing. And please get in touch with me if you want to discuss your prioritization tricks. And um, if you're interested in iZettle, we're actually hiring. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that. Thank you.